Do more is a call to action for all Australians to be allies, making the commitment to become more informed, more educated, and more engaged in creating positive change to challenge racism. This conversation series seeks to make change through storytelling. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community, and what we learn through storytelling culture of the longest continuous civilization on the planet. We pay our respect to elders, past and present. I'm Shelley Ware, and today I'll be talking to Morgan Mitchell, Australian sprinter for the Do More campaign. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and their families. Now, Morgan, it's so good to talk to you. And on behalf of the Do More campaign, how are you going? Oh, well, first, thanks for having me. Um, I'm doing quite well, to be honest. I'm currently in Denver, Colorado, and it's sunny, so I can't complain. Now, we're not here to talk about the light subjects, of course. We're here to talk about some heavy subjects, so we'll get straight into it. Racism. How does it show up in your life? Uh, it's interesting, to be honest. Like, from such a young age, I've experienced little bits here and there, and it's not until I've gotten older that it's kind of clicked that it is racist and a lot of, well, racism and a lot of things that have come up in my life, I kind of reflect and it does make me quite sad, but, you know, be anything from being an athlete, you're expected to be fast just because of your skin colour. You know, you, I get a few modelling jobs and people want to say, oh, she's just the token black girl. And you just kind of have to roll with it because I've never known how to, you know, speak up about how it's wrong or how it makes me feel. And yeah, so for such a long time, I've just had to cop it, which is quite sad. And you know, even some of my friends and old friends have actually been quite racist, but within the topic of conversation, they've never actually understood even the smallest things can actually be quite racist, even if it's coming from what they think is a good place. So it's kind of exciting being a part of the Do More campaign, you know, just to spread the word and actually educate people on things that they can and cannot say. Yeah, it's those subtle little things that sometimes our friends can say that are um, yeah. hard to pull up, aren't they? How do you physically react in your body? For, it's a bit tough because it, it's like almost like a weak feeling deep inside. You know, like I feel like I don't belong. And oh, it's even when you like mention it, I just kind of get a little bit like, oh, a little bit limp and yeah. sad because, you know, I don't know any different. I've lived in my body for 25, almost 26 years. And it's kind of like, well, why, why am I being treated different? And I start questioning myself and then I start sweating. And then like, you know, it's just all of these different kind of things within my body show, like I'll slump and I just don't want to be seen and I try to hide. And, you know, obviously this year has been a huge awakening for the whole world in terms of racism and it's kind of refreshing because it's nice to know you're not alone and there are people out there that want to help and make a change. When I do show up to certain events and shows, I do find that I might only be the only brown girl in the room or brown person for that matter, or I might be the only brown girl on the track. And then when I do hear little remarks and people, you know, there's underlying, like those sly comments that they try to put in and you know what they mean. It definitely has attacked my well-being, I guess. And I've had times where I haven't wanted, wanted to go to photo shoots. I haven't wanted to rock up to personal speaking um, seminars or events because I just think, why me? What's going to happen if I go today? Is someone else there? Are they going to judge me, my appearance, what I'm wearing, where, where I'm coming from? And that was one thing that I've had to work on quite a bit, especially this year. Um, it's just the fact that it's like, you know what? I'm always going to be brown. My colour's not going anywhere. I love the skin I'm in. <laughs> and if people can't, if people don't like that, it's not actually my fault that they don't like me. I know I'm a good person and I know I'm trying to do the right thing in my life. So that's their own personal issue that, yes, I can try and help educate them on, but if they don't want the help, then, you know, there's only so much I can do before it just keeps dragging me down. Tell me a little bit about what it's like to work in the modelling industry. Uh, I guess working in the modelling industry, it, is quite tough. Obviously it's humbling because you know people want you, but for such a long time in, within Australia, I've only really seen myself in Elizabeth Cambridge. But we're usually the only two black girls that are representing a huge community. And I just don't think that's very fair. Um, obviously it is, you know, I could say, oh, I just love all the money that comes my way. I love all the free stuff, but deep in my heart, I just think there are other girls just as beautiful with more talent and, you know, more ambitions to become a model that probably deserve my role um, and it is tough because I am always running and I'm here there everywhere around the country around the world sorry and I just think there are other girls out there with 
that are different shades, that are darker than me, that are lighter than me, that are, you know, Aboriginal or Ghanaian or whatever, and still call themselves Australian, who are Aussies, that deserve that same opportunity. Um, and I just think, for me, companies looking for me and whatever, and I guess, yes, thank you, but there are other girls out there that do, that do deserve that opportunity. And this is me, I guess, speaking out, saying I'm happy to give my spot to them, really. And So how do you fight against that systemic racism that you were talking about earlier, about how people perceive you, that you need to be faster because of the colour of your skin or that you're just here because of this? What, what are ways that you fight against that systemic racism? To be honest, it's funny because I never used to. I used to just cop it and go out there and just do what I know I'm good at. But now I just like to question people. And I definitely pull people up on it if I actually am seeing it blatantly in front of my face. I just ask the simple questions like, why do you think that? And it's kind of nice because then it gets the people that are making those comments and statements, it gets them to think about what they're saying and why they're saying it. And then they're apologetic and all that, which is quite nice. But it's also like, okay, we've addressed this situation, but you also need to make sure that you're not going to do it again to other people, you know, because I'd like to think I am quite strong. Over the years, I've built quite a thick skin being in this industry. But, you know, there's someone out there that looks up to me or, you know, to Anana, my friend Nana, to yourself or Misty or Ben Simmons. And they, you know, they probably can't protect themselves or stand up for themselves. So we collectively need to be able to show them that it is okay to speak out against it. So then they can actually do the same thing and it kind of just changes that narrative in people's minds. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's definitely just speaking out about it more. It sure does have a ripple effect on to people and giving other people strength. So well done to you. So tell me about the Australia that you grew up in. To be honest, the Australia I grew up in was very confusing. You know, mm. I look back now and once I reflect, it's just like, wow. So many things that I thought were normal definitely aren't. A lot of things that I'm finding out now about how, you know, brown, black, Aboriginal people are treated and other minorities just makes me a little bit sick. Because, you know, a lot of my friends here in America, with, you know, the protests that are going on, the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and all that, like, oh, but Australia just looks so happy. And I'm like, man, <laughs> you always get shivers, right? It's like, if only you knew. And, and they realise that it doesn't matter whether you're killing someone for the colour of their skin or excluding someone, they're just as bad, you know, because that rolls into something else, which could be potentially worse. And that's what I try to explain to them is a lot of people don't think we have issues in Australia but we really do, you know. Mm. We, the, the saddest part for me growing up in Australia is that we don't actually learn about it and there hasn't really been any kind of action that has been, you know, no one's taken any kind of action to actually change that for the better. So, yeah, growing up for me was kind of like, oh, we'll hide you from all the bad stuff and as long as you run, you'll be fine. Just run, smile, model and get over all that. And I think, you know, the older you get, the more you realise this just isn't right, especially someone that is, you know, brown. I can't just sit back and think, oh, the next brown girl that comes along, she can just, you know, if she's successful, then the rest of her people don't matter when actually they do matter. They're still human beings with goals and dreams. Did you grow up with a lot of diversity in your life? The primary school I went to, it was Galilee in South Melbourne. And from an early age, you know, there were white kids, Asian kids, Europeans, black, and there was a mix. And everyone, it was just cool because when you're a kid, you're all friends because you don't care what one another mm. will look like. And obviously, I guess I was kind of that diverse child growing up, you know, going to going through high school and university, um, which kind of also taught me, my mum's white, my dad's black. It taught me to actually not really care about the colour of people's skin because I am both, you know what I mean? So especially with the racism and what's going on, I've never understood why people hate people for the colour of their skin. Mm. I see the good and bad in everyone and it's just like, Honestly, it was mind blowing because when you're a kid, you don't even think about it. And it's not until you have that one negative comment being drilled into your head to dislike a certain thing that you grow up believing that. Part of being you know, an Australian, how did that factor into your understanding of an experience of living as an Australian and your identity? I could say I feel like I belong, but it's hard to say that you feel like you belong when you've been lied to for so long. You know what I mean? Like you're Aboriginal, and I'm sure you could tell me so many stories about your people that I've never even known. Yeah. I've, I've never learnt in school. And it's hard to be like, yeah, I'm an Aussie, when I don't even know anything about Aboriginal culture. Like, it's a very tough thing to say. And I don't want to offend anyone, but how can you say that you belong to a country that won't even educate you on what that country is about and where they came, like, where the country came from and grew from and 
to be what it is now. So yeah. yeah, for me, it's a bit of a tough one and it's a bit of pill to swallow because again, I probably could have done more to learn. Um, but when you, when you grow up here, I wish people understood that there's so many things that we've missed out on in terms of culture and that sense of belonging where we can all actually be one and live freely. Have you ever experienced um, the support of an ally or, or in fact been an ally for somebody? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I think we all have, surely, in one way or another. And um, my friend, one of my best friends, Nana, has been interviewed. And we've both experienced racism, either together or separately. And we've actually been there for one another, through thick and thin. <laughs> She's one of the most amazing people. And it's funny, like, there's a lot I've learnt from people here in America. My mum's current boyfriend, who's African-American, that have all kind of supported me along the way. And it's nice to... You know, I sometimes doubt myself, for sure. People don't know that and they probably don't see it, but I doubt myself a lot. And I do actually just need, you know, a strong black female or a strong black man to tell me, you have to love the skin you're in, you have to do this, this and this, because you cannot let anyone try and tell you otherwise just because of your colour. So, yeah, for I think along the way, without the people in my life that have actually been there, uh, I don't even know where I'd be, you know what I mean? Because you spend so many nights just crying over your own appearance that it's just like there are times where I'm just like this is just ridiculous I need to kind of move on I need to talk to some people and it is nice like even my mum she finds it very hard because she's um obviously white and she's like I don't know what to say so half the time she's like I just don't know what to say because I've loved you for who you are not the color of your skin and if you can just go out and do that to give that love to everyone else then I guess I've done my role as a mother yeah it is nice knowing that you do have support and you do have people that are in your corner and it sometimes doesn't even matter what colour they are. You know, some of my white friends are just as amazing. And it is very, it is quite humbling. It's like, wow, you know, you, you know they're a real friend if they're going to stick up for something that must be probably harder for them than it is for me. You know what I mean? Because they've got no idea or have never been through it. So, yeah, definitely there is support. Zimor is the campaign we're talking to. Tell me a bit about how you have witnessed people when they've stopped racism. Oh, I see it more so online. I think I witnessed obviously social media is a big part of everyone's lives these days and <laughs> it is quite interesting because you know I see people that follow me or whatever and if they see even the slightest little bit of racism they're oh, the yeah. first people to call it out and that's quite exciting it is nice to know that there are people out there like that and I get a lot of inboxes as well for from people asking for you know more information what can I do and all this and I definitely have seen it in the streets and even at the track you know one of one small example was, I think about less than a year ago, I saw there's a security guard and the way he was treating me versus someone else was just mm. a bit, <laughs> I can't you swear <laughs> on this, can I? It's a bit shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that person, the person that he was actually treating differently to me stood up and said, mate, come on, we're both here yeah. to run on the track. Like I can see you're treating her completely different. I'm not sure why. I don't want to get stuck into it. But to have like, you know, a white male stick up for me. <laughs> I know it's quite, yeah, it, it sounds stupid. You know, it's, for me, it sounds unbelievable because you know, we're almost taught to hate the white man, but it's like, you know, not everyone's bad. It doesn't matter about the colour of your skin. Usually it, it's actually what's in your heart. You've spoken about it and sometimes, you know, I've felt it through my life as well. Sometimes it's really difficult to call out racism yeah. and do it by stepping up. Can you tell us the time that you stepped up and what you did? There were two incidents that were pretty similar. And it was actually a talk that I had to do for a certain company, which I obviously won't mention for legal reasons. Mm -hmm. And I was being treated, you know, no one wanted a bar of me. I remember walking in and everyone was just staring like, why, you, you get the why, is, why is she here look. And you can't really explain it to people. Like, I'm sure you would, would know exactly what I mean. I know that everyone way. else would be like, don't worry about it. They're just looking. I'm like, no, it's the, what are you doing here in our business, in our realm? And I immediately felt a little bit uncomfortable and I scanned the room and there was only me and one other black person, a black female. And I was kind of disappointed because it was a room of about 80 people, 80 or 90 people. Mm. And no one wanted to talk to me. And I'm like, that's fine, whatever. You know, I'm just here for my, I'm just here for the um, public speaking appearance. And it was funny, as soon as I got up and said, hi, I'm Morgan Mitchell, I'm an Olympian. Their ears perk up Hello. and they're all engaged. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I forgot I had to actually do something to be welcomed. Yeah. So I had my chat, I sit down, and after it, they're all coming up. And it's mm. quite funny because then they want to try and help, they want your help promoting their products. They want to give you their business cards to come to their events. 
And at the end of it, I sat down with the company and said, look, I appreciate you guys having me here, but I felt so, I, I told them I felt quite shit and I wasn't really represented. And it was quite sad to see that there was no real diversity in the room. And I said, moving forward, it's hard for me to ever come back to a place like this, knowing that you don't want to include other black women, other Asian women or men or, you know, just a diverse range of people. And it wasn't to take a stab at the people in the room, but they could have done a better job at actually, you know, showing that we are inclusive. We don't just pick you because you've done something good. We also want to show girls that come from your background and other backgrounds that they too can do something in their lives and they can feel included in this kind of, you know, society with business people and all that. And the other one was just every time I, you know, sign certain documents or um, what would you call it, like sponsorships and endorsements, I do try to ask them, like, I've seen, I've seen the little black tile on your Instagram. I've seen that you're showing everyone on social media that you want to do more and want to educate yourselves. But let's check, let's take a look in your back room. You know what I mean? How many people yeah. actually are black? You know, anyone can post a tile on social media. But moving forward, I think it's great to acknowledge it. But the second step is actually to take action. And if you're not taking action, I just can't be a part of it because to me, that's just fake money. The sponsors that sign, sign people on and can actually show that they're doing the right thing behind the scenes, you know, like, hey, we really want to learn more. This is what we're doing. Not just, hey, we need you to model for us to show that we look like we're doing something. Like there's more to life than money and <laughs> selling product, guys. <laughs> Can you describe to me an Australia that is got no racism and it's just this beautiful place for everyone to live? What, what would that look like, Australia with no racism? What that would look like to me is an education system like we've touched on before where Aboriginal culture is compulsory. You have to learn about it. And not only that, I've sat down and I've talked to my mum's boyfriend, who's amazing, and we've both agreed, like, what... <laughs> An Australia that isn't racist would be learned about Aboriginal culture, but now we need to start giving Aboriginal people more of an opportunity to have their say on how this country is run. I mean, it's very hard to vote when they're all just one certain type of person. <laughs> you know, it's just all just whitewashed. Am I allowed to say that? Yes. You know what I mean? Like, that's a, that's a, you know, I even watched the news when they were talking about George Floyd and what we said, everyone's having their opinion on black lives, but they're all white. You know, it's just actually showing that we are diverse, we are learning. We're freeing the flag. That's the number one thing. It's like, it's very hard to want to go to the Olympics. And the, you, I, don't know, I, I don't know how it would look, but it'd be nice to see both the Aboriginal flag and the Australian one, or just the mm -hmm. Aboriginal one. Just something, because for me, it's very important for the whole, whole world to understand what we represent when we step out onto the track or onto the basketball court or the swimming pool, that we're more than just one flag. And so, yeah, for me, I guess it is definitely just seeing it in schools, universities, it has to be compulsory, you know, within businesses, has to be compulsory. Within, I mean, you know, the people running this country, it just has to, it doesn't, it's, it's like simple math, one plus one equals two. Like, yeah. Aboriginal people, first people of this land, we need their help. They are the smartest, they are most in touch with this country. <laughs> it blows my mind. So I, I reckon that's the number one thing that blows my mind, and I think that would be the best thing for Australia is for people when you are voting and when you are, you know, listening to the government. I don't ever pay too much attention because for obvious reasons, it just doesn't make sense. But, you know, I would pay more attention and want to be more involved if I could see the diversity and the inclusion there. You know what I mean? Because it's so important, even for, like, we always go back and touch on young, young kids and, you know, the future generation that are all growing up. They need to understand that if we want this place to actually truly be diverse and inclusive and full of love, change has to start at the top. We can't always rely on children to do the job for us. You know, we vote these Absolutely. people in to make change. Stop relying on the kids to do everything. Because people ask me, don't you think the kids need to do it? Like, <laughs> they don't need to be kids. <laughs> yeah. Let them play in the park. We're the ones that actually have to take action and make change for them. Yeah. Like, so that's what I see is definitely, it just being plastered everywhere you know, to change the narrative in people's minds. And just, I think a lot of people do need to come to terms with it, just accepting it. You have to mm. accept it and you have to understand why, for sure. So, mm. And it's yeah. making it a part of who they are as well. For know? sure. Like, they're awesome. Day. So how do people do more? 
I would say start by asking the right questions within yourself as well. Pick yourself up on the things that you know are wrong and that you're doing. And it's always, you know, it's very hard to be honest and true to what's going on and to change that narrative. And then it'd be, you know, picking up on other people's actions after you have actually kind of like, you know, almost like cleansed yourself of all your negative ways. And then to just promote it, you know what I mean? And to live it every single day because it's only going to take about a month of you sitting in that uncomfortable space before it just becomes normal. And then you're fighting for something bigger than yourself and your personal, you know, personal preference. So for me, that's how people do more. And it's just to always continue to take action. You can't, like I said, social media is not even, it's such a temporary thing. People just want to see the hot topic at that moment and then they'll move on to the next big thing. And we saw it with the bushfires, the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, now it's back to the pandemic. Like we actually have to just keep this ball rolling. So for me, it's always like, yeah, acknowledge it, but action is the most important part. You can't just say you're going to do something and then not do it. So definitely just, yeah, check into the Do More website. You know, I love clothing the gap and the girls behind that. And just researching, yeah, they're awesome. But researching these websites and don't be afraid to reach out and just ask questions to actually understand and better your knowledge around the topic. Who do you reach out to or who do you listen to like on social media or in movies or whose voice stands out to you that you could recommend to other people to listen to? Well, I'd definitely say obviously the Do More campaign. It's, it's mean, not, not even a plug. It's because it, it's an obvious one, right? Yeah. Um, Clothing the Gap at the moment is definitely my favourite. One movie that made me, I don't usually like, I don't like sad movies, romantic movies. I only like comedy, horror, action, right? <laughs> but um, Rabbit Proof Fence, the movie oh was recommended to me. And I would say if anyone has a spare few hours, it's to sit down and watch that because, oh man, that was like the most heartbreaking but inspiring mm -hmm. movie that I think I've ever watched in my life, like tears. And clothing the gap's great. You get to shop online as well. <laughs> you can learn how to shop. I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> so what's one small thing that people could do in their daily life to stop racism? One small thing is you could do is just educate yourself on a new piece of information every day for a month until, you know, you've kind of got the reins. Or one small thing is even if you're thinking a thought when you're scrolling through social media or, you know, watching TV or whatever, it's stop yourself and think why was I going to make that negative comment was that negative comment racist and then to just be honest with yourself because you know sometimes I do it I'll scroll you know we're all guilty of scrolling through and you're unhappy with something you know sometimes I'd be unhappy with certain parts of my body and I'd see some, someone with something I want and I'd mentally try yes. to attack them and it's like Jeez, they don't control your life like get over it so I think that's probably one thing people can pick up on is it first starts off with that you know those inner thoughts and just stopping and being like, okay, why am I saying it? Why am I thinking it? Is it right? No, it's not. How do I change the narrative? Okay, let's move on and try not to do it again. So what about a big thing? What's a big call to action that people could do to end racism? I would say it starts with honestly contacting the government, <laughs> especially in Australia. Like the biggest thing for me at the moment is free the flag. I think it should be on everyone's minds. And for me, you know, any kind of action starts with the government. That's why we vote those people in. So, I mean, it sounds pretty big, but all it takes is an email, petition, call, you know, certain things. Because it's like, you know, the LGBTQI community and women's rights. Look at how far they've come. So people try and tell me that you can't change something. Yes, you can. If we all band together, the larger the group, the more success. So I think that's where it could start. Thank you so much, Morgan Mitchell, for being with us here today. And openly and generously sharing your beautiful and wise wisdom about what can be a really difficult subject to talk about in racism. So thank you for being a part of the Do More campaign and take care over there in America. We'll be looking forward to having you safely back here in Australia. And we certainly know everybody can do more. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Shelley. Thanks for having me. Find ways you can do more at domoreproject.com.au.